together with Pathways for Lay Leadership, and to serve as your MC. Evie Severino will be serving as our Zoom Tech Coordinator. Thank you, Evie. Our event tonight is being recorded. Uh, you will be muted. I guess you already are. Any questions and comments you may have during the event can be done via the chat function by moving your cursor to the bottom of the screen and enabling the chat function and then directing uh, your chat uh, questions or comments to Mimi Dara. Uh, the Association of Pittsburgh Priests is a diocesan-wide organization of ordained and non-ordained women and men who uh, act on our baptismal call to be priests and prophets. Our mission, rooted in the gospel and the spirit of Vatican II, is to carry out a ministry of justice and renewal in ourselves, the church, and the world. We're very fortunate tonight to have as our second speaker in our fall series, Deborah Rose Milovec, co-director of Future Church, who will speak on What About Women? The Promise of Women's Full Participation in the Catholic Church. This is an issue that has been on the agenda of the APP, APP for much of its over five decade history. Our format tonight will be an opening prayer an introduction of our speaker, uh, Deb Rose Melovec's presentation. We will have breakout groups and then a large group back together again for report backs and Q&A, some concluding announcements, and then a closing prayer. We hope to conclude between 8.30 and 9 p.m. So now please join me in welcoming Marlene Millick for our opening uh, prayer. Marlene. The following is a quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Paragraph 369 reads as follows. Men and women have been created, which is to say willed by God, in perfect equality as human persons and in their respective beings as men and women. Being a man or a woman is a reality which is good. Men and women possess an inalienable dignity which comes to them immediately from God. Men and women have one and the same dignity in the image of God and reflect the creator's wisdom and goodness, end quote. Dear Lord, we pray that soon we will become capable of living these truths. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Marlene. Now, Sister Barbara Finch will introduce our speaker. Good evening. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Deb Rose Milovec, uh, and as she uh, uh, likes to be called, Deb. Deb has more than 20 years' experience uh, in working in community and church based organizations. She's been educated in theology, church history, and Catholic social teaching. She brings this background to her administrative, supervisory, and development experience in nonprofit organizations. Her professional experience includes serving as executive director of the New Choices Domestic Violence Prevention Agency and Shelter in Shelby County, Ohio, program director for the American Friends Service Committee, and Vice President and Project Director of St. Catherine of Siena Virtual College with special outreach to Africa, China, India, the Philippines, Thailand, and Latin America. Deb holds a master's degree in theology and a bachelor's degree in international studies. She has been trained as a lay pastoral minister from the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. So welcome, Deb. Thank you so much. I just wanted to uh, thank John Osterley, who I think invited maybe a year ago before COVID, <laughs> which, so I would have been there in person. So this is a very, very different format and I hope you can all bear with me tonight. And I wanna thank every one of you from the Association of Pittsburgh Priests for inviting me. I got your book. I read your, a big chunk of your history and I have to say I'm really amazed with your vision and your prophetic way of being together. I think you're a microcosm of what we hope for in the larger church. So I'm really honored to be here. 
I want to say that tonight's topic is a tough one. Uh, I am a mother of five. I have 14 grandchildren. And I have a lot of skin in the game when it comes to women in the church and women in the world. So uh, I've been working all my life for women's equality, women's full participation in the church and in the world. And I really, really am an advocate. It's my passion uh, since I can remember. Uh, so I'm very uh, glad to be able to do this work. I've done a lot, as you might guess, presentations on this topic of women in the church. And each time I develop one, it comes out of a particular place. Uh, I have been with Future Church as long as Pope Francis has been Pope. And so I have been here during his pontificate. And so each time I give a presentation, it depends on where we are in, in the Francis cycle. So, um, and I just wanna start off by saying, I developed this uh, talk tonight really out of a, out of a place of deep sadness. Um, I have been to every synod since, uh, since the Pope Francis became Pope. And I have to say that first and foremost, I'm glad that I had a chance to go to the synods because under Pope Francis, people were able to attend that hadn't been able to attend before under John Paul II and Benedict. So uh, just to say, first and foremost, Pope Francis really does open doors. And so I was able to go to the synods and I've been following the synods and I'm going to talk tonight about some of the structures uh, that make it possible for us to imagine how women will become full and equal partners in this church. But I have to say that after the Synod on the Amazon, having listened to so many stories from women in the Amazon, from hearing the stories of bishops there, I was, my heart was hooked. I, I fell in love with the women who were talking about what they were doing in this very difficult region of the world, in this beautiful and yet very exploited and endangered region of the world. And I saw that they had come together by the end of that synod and had discerned that not only did they need protection, but they needed a vehicle to build the church there because priests are rare. They will continue to be rare. Women are the face of the church there. And I have to say, uh, with Pope Francis in uh, exhortation, Carita Amazonia, uh, when he did not take those proposals forward, I was deeply disappointed. I was hurt because actually <laughs> I was so, I so much believe in Pope Francis. I believe in his vision. I believe in where he takes, is taking the church. And uh, I really did think that we were gonna see some real movement there. So, so I've had to, so this, talk tonight is a bit of my own sort of going deep inside myself, entering back into the pain of a setback, and then looking at things again and saying, is there hope for women? And I will say at the beginning, yes, there is. When I step back and I look at, at what's happening in the church, there, this, this promise of women's full equality in the church is, is going to be realized. And it's gonna be realized because women are the change agents and their, and their allies. So, uh, so let me begin. Now, I'm gonna show a, a, a PowerPoint presentation tonight. Uh, I'm going to, uh, hopefully this will all work out just fine. But, um, so I'm gonna be sharing my screen now. And I'll start this thing. And hopefully, can you all see that, I guess, Somebody will check on that. Uh, so um, I'm going to go through some slides. And then from time to time, I'm going to actually, before the end of the meeting, actually ask you to respond a little bit to some of my questions. So we can have more than just you watching my talking head, that we can have a little dialogue back and forth. So let's see if I can get this all to work. So this question of women's full and equal participation in the church is a good one, since we know that there are still seven sacraments for men and six for women. The promise of opening the doors for the diaconate for women via the work of the original commission that was created and the Amazon Synod has been waylaid. Women do not have a deliberative voice in the church and women's wisdom and expertise are rarely considered 
when teachings are developed. For instance, in Pope Francis' latest apostolic exhortation, Fratelli Tutti, there are more than 300 sources cited, but not one of them is from a woman theologian or scholar. He uses men as models, and except for Mary, no other women are cited in this. And I think in a document that talks about the abolition of the death penalty, and uh, that certainly we could have had uh, Sister Helen Prejean as one of the people that were modeled in that. But I think the document is exquisite, it's challenging, yet it could have been better, as all Catholic social teaching could be better if women were truly co-equals, co-partners in the development of those teachings. So I'm gonna to start tonight with where I started on this journey as I went deep. I, I was looking back through some of the women who have led in the church and I found Mary Luke Tobin and I've actually studied a lot about the women at the Second Vatican too, so she's like an old friend to me. So she, reflecting on her role as auditor at the Second Vatican Council some 34 years after she had attended, Sister of Loretto, Mary Luke Tobin wrote this quote, this emerging women's movement in the Roman Catholic Church has captured attention worldwide because it is challenging and intransient and patriarchal tradition of the church and is making serious headway toward its goal of restoring the equality in theory and practice that belongs to a Christian and Catholic theolo theology of persons. Mary Luke Tobin was certainly a pioneer. She was a change agent. She had already gotten on a boat to go over to the third session of, of the Vatican Council when she got notice from Paul VI that she was going to be able to join as an observer. So she and 15 women joined nearly 3,000 cardinals, bishops, religious, theologians, milling around. They became part of the mix in the, thir in the third year of the Vatican Council. And she's got a great sense of humor because she talks about how when women would walk by the bishops, they would look down <laughs> and that they even built their own coffee bar because apparently some of the bishops couldn't swallow coffee with women in their presence. So, uh, and they effectually named it Bar None. Though they were officially observers, Tobin and the women helped bring the church up to date. They lobbied to be invited into the rooms where the documents were being formulated and Bernard Herring, one of the theologians there, was smart enough to use his own influence to get him in, the, in those rooms. And you can actually trace some of their, their words and their influence in Gaudium et Spes and some of the other documents. So it's been more than 50 years since Tobin entered the halls of the male dominated Vatican Council and the church has experienced a lot of change. So my first question for all of you tonight is, based on your experience, do you agree with Mary Luke Tobin that the church is making serious progress towards women's equality and full participation in the church today? Now, one of the things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna ask those folks who would like to uh, say something about that, uh, and I hope you will, to unmute yourself. When you unmute yourself, you come to the top of the list of participants, and then I'll just call on you, and you can um, have a comment if you'd like. So I see Sister Mary Geraldine, you have opened up your um, mic. Did you have a comment? I think that we are making progress, but not as much as we'd like at this time. So we just have hope that we can continue on. True. Anyone else have a comment about progress or not? What's your experience as a woman or an ally of women in the church? Pat Ball? Um, I can't say as I really see much progress. Um, it seems like it's talked about a lot, 
but nothing official has really been done to um, to make women's roles more um, inclusive. Yeah, um, I think um, in many parishes, women do play a big role, but it's not a sanctioned role. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I can't say that officially in the church, I really see much change at all. Hmm. So there's a big difference between what happens at the local level and what's happening in the wider church. In your yeah, I think so. Frank, Frank Harris, you have a comment? Yes, please. Uh, um, the last time I attended this, uh, this organization's meeting, was in, uh, I think, around 1967 or 8. I can assure you there were no women in the room then. And, and <laughs> I, just, I just took a list of the participants here and was um, amazed. Uh, not, but I recognized this room's full because so many other doors are closed. Hmm. And um, people are coming to this organization out of a sense of... Uh, uh, disappointment or, or out of ne negative experiences everywhere else practically. So uh, I think my answer is yes, I think there is progress, but it's just a little bit here and there. And it's appalling how little there is. Thank you. I love that insight. This room's full because there's a lot of doors closed. That's actually how it is for a lot of people who are part of Future Church as well. It's the way people maintain their faith. Betsy, I'm not sure how to say your last name. Swainer. Yeah. Swainer, thank you. Hi. Hi, uh, we, um, I'm part of uh, Catholics for Change in Our Church, which is an organization. We actually came to your rally right before oh, yeah. we were shut down yeah. and, um, in, in Ohio. And... Um, what we've noticed is uh, the focus group that I'm in in that organization was at, at the local level, like Pat was saying, not much change and not, not a whole lot of interest in doing that. Um, when the grand jury report was released and then our local bishop of Pittsburgh put a response to that and people he had listening sessions and many people brought up lots of topics at those listening sessions and every one of them, there were numerous people that brought up about women being deacons or priests or married men being priests. And then when the, and then when they did the summary of all the things that people brought up, even things that were bad to the priests or, you know, not complimentary, and they listed them all in the report, but they didn't mention the word woman was not in the report once in terms of the bishop's response. And it really was saying, do you not see us? Do you not hear it? And, oh, wow. and he said, oh, that was an oversight. <laughs> but then we tried to bring it up to talk about, like they wouldn't even talk about saying that we could talk about it, you know, in a, in a synod. So, because that was something that the Pope yeah. was in charge of not. So it really made me feel like we are not, um, hmm. not moving along as far as, as we would like. And thank you, that Betsy. That's, wow, thank you. That's really an important insight. I see David McPherson, maybe? Uh, Actually, that's my husband. I'm oh. Roseanne, I'm Roseanne Grenieri. I'm just using oh, Rose. Okay, very good. Um, uh, and, you know, I think a lot of us are, great, are grateful coming from parishes where women are respected, myself included, um, because we are included in some of the higher level things. However, I think it is in general more of a placating role because the elephant in the room for me is that it is still unquestionably door closed for women being priests. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the open-mindedness toward opening that discussion is absent. Um, and so in answer to your question, I think like everyone else has said, there has been some progress, but it's not progress that clearly meets the equality of women in giving their talents toward the church. And that to me is the fact that they are door closed, no priests. I think the, the, the attention toward women as deacon is a placating effort. Um, and and not, until, not until women are truly considered the role of priest, a call for priesthood that many women have but can't exercise, they will never have that equal footing. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Mary, I'll yes. just maybe one or two more and then I'll get going again. Mary, I see uh, you don't have a last name here, but Mary. Uh, sadly, in the Diocese of Pittsburgh, the clergy risk a great deal if they speak in support of ordination of women because the bishop has the power to control their pensions. Mm -hmm. they, they really do risk a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's up to the women, I think, to, um, to keep bringing that up. I, I brought it up at a public meeting with our bishop when he was talking about his plan for reorganization of the diocese. And I asked the question, is there any conversation about other options for ordination? And I speak specifically of uh, a married clergy, ordination of women, and the poor man almost collapsed. He just waved his arms in the air and said, oh, that's, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> oh, that's great. So let's just, uh, let's see, maybe uh, Joseph, I, Onifer, oh, I hope I'm saying these words correctly. Sorry if I butcher your names. Um, I'm Mrs. Onifer. Oh, there you go. Thanks. <laughs> My name is Sharon. Um, I have two pieces that have always stuck with me. And one is with the precepts of the church. It says that the moral life is bound to and nourished by the liturgical life. And I think we need to discuss that because the point is the morality of the whole thing. Is, is it right as it stands now? And does it need to change? That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is back in around 1980, uh, uh, there was a piece put out by the U.S. bishops that says, brothers and sisters to us. And I know at that point, uh, and it was supposed to be about race. If you take this book, you can still get it at Amazon, because I lost mine from 1980, uh, and read it. And every place where it says racism, you can cross out and put sexism, in, and it reads perfectly. So I think there are things to consider in some of the documents of the church and really have some discussion about them. Uh, it, it, it's just fascinating in so many ways. The only uh, negative thing I ever heard about this was the fact that this really should have uh, read brothers and sisters and stopped there. And by putting the two us, the bishop just made it them and us. And there was that divide. So this book should have been just being called brothers and sisters. So there yeah. are my two thoughts that I carry with me. And um, thank you. Later, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your input. I'm going to go back to the presentation, but I, I want to tell you that um, I, I it, what you say is so um, rich and so important because the, 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 we have a long, long learning curve in, in terms of the hierarchy in the church. And learning how to reach out to our uh, black brothers and sisters and uh, to overcome that part of our legacy, as well as the sexism, is going to be a long, long row. Uh, so, um, so I'm going to go back and move back into my share screen again and see if I can get this to go. So... As I said, when I started, there, there really has been serious progress under Pope Francis. And I want to show you how I come to that. And, and again, I am, this, everything I'm talking about tonight is, is really uh, focused around uh, the highest level of the church. Okay, so I'm not talking about what's happening at your parish level, which is actually often, well, it depends on your priest. Uh, much better for for um, in terms of women in the church. So um, so so we know that Vatican II created a new reality. It was a church th that could engage the modern world. That's what John the twenty third was hoping for. That was his dream, and and Paul the second and the Vatican Council carried that forward. Now that was good news for women, uh, women religious. They took off their habits, 
they transformed the insular cultures of their communities, and they reached out to the world in a new way. They entered into academic institutions, they became theologians, they became seminary professors, they became academic professors, they were CEOs, they were CFOs, they became pastoral administrators. They were, they were and are, as women are in the church, 80% of the lay ministry in the Catholic Church. So women are the backbone of the church. And Vatican II, that great experiment, that great movement forward, that great engagement with the modern world helps set that in motion. And feminist, womanist, mujerista theology takes hold precisely because women are living this new vision of the church, the Vatican II vision. And we see that in this, Let's see here, uh, hold on. So we're in this time of foment, foment uh, where women are, women's equality there, uh, is happening. Women are burning their bras in the 60s and 70s. Women are demanding their rights. And in 1976, the Philadelphia 11 Episcopal women pioneer a new path to the priesthood. And that causes the Catholic churchmen to say, Whoa. Catholic churchmen react by redlining their domain. So under Paul VI, enter Insignioris in 76, says women can't be priests because they can't image Christ. Now that's heretical, but that's what it said. And then Pope John Paul II tries to um, excuse me, I'm trying to find where I am here, tries to immortalize that assertion by claiming infallibility. He demands silence on the topic and he punishes dissenters. And then he builds an alternate reality. It's a theological and anthropological universe where women are equal to men in dignity, but have different roles according to their sex. And that's divinely determined according to John Paul II. He comes up with this problem that we have. It's called complementarity. And complementarity in and of itself is not bad, but the way the Catholic Church applies it is, is subordination all over again. It is that what I call the Catholic separate but equal clause. And it demonstrates how clerics can rationalize, then divinize, every effort they make to con maintain control. Women are feminine geniuses, but they cannot give a homily at mass. When Benedict XVI took over, uh, was elected after John Paul II died, he really cracked down on the women religious in the United States. I don't know if you remember the 2009, then 2012 investigation. He was investigating them. He really was after them because of their quote, radical feminist themes. And so this sort of terrorizing of Catholic women continued under uh, Benedict VII. And of course, Cardinal Levada had something to do with that as well as other US prelates who were mad at the nuns because they were with, they wanted the Affordable Care Act to uh, pass among uh, some, of the, uh, some of the issues and the nuns stayed with the poor on that. So you see, I think they were surprised though to see the pushback from American Catholics. Um, thousands and thousands of people came out and with signs just like this in cities all over the United States. And I think the nuns were surprised, honestly, at how much support they had from Catholics who um, may have never ever gotten up or gotten aroused on any occasion about anything came out and protested because of what was happening with the nuns. And then Pope Benedict resigned and on March 12th, 2013, Pope Francis was elected. Now, if you look out there on the, on the, on the one side of the slide, out in that crowd, uh, I'm there. I was there that night when he was elected. It was a grand night. It was really, it was, it was beautiful. And uh, it was beautiful to have him want a blessing from us as well as bless us. It was, it was a, a, 
a beautiful moment where we saw that this Pope was truly someone new in our, in our church. So I wanted to ask a question here, um, uh, again, in this uh, form. The election of Pope Francis, did the election of Pope Francis bring you hope? Did you think he would be an advocate for women? Did you think he would want women, he would be an advocate for women taking more leadership in ministry and governance in the church? So let's see if anyone has a response to that. And I'll use the same system again. So if you have a, a comment, go ahead and, and tell us about your hopes under Pope Francis or not. So Ellie Field. Yes. My thought is that I don't think we could expect Pope Francis to shake the church at its roots and change overnight. This was thousands of years in the making. And I think we have to realize that we want evolution, not revolution, which takes a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's up against some terrible opposition. And even, you know, you see it within the priests. Or he's a terrible man or he's a good man. Uh, I think what he's doing is wonderful. He's accepted about women moving, but I don't think we can ex expect him to change it overnight. I think that's uh, high in the sky. Thank you, Ellie. Anybody else have a comment? I do. I think, I think he's had a little bit of a change in the governance. Um, and he set a model in terms of, of even in our local diocese here, uh, women have been hired. I think the last seven hires have, have all been women. Uh, mm. But that doesn't mean uh, it, it, it's probably not in the ministry and it's still at a lower level compared to where I think we all want to be. Mm. So you attribute that to Francis, a Francis influence that women, the last seven hires have been women. I think so, yeah. Okay. And Kathleen Matasek? Matasek, yes. Matasek, I'm sorry. Uh, to answer you directly, um, yes, initially I did have hope, but I think to paraphrase uh, something I heard from Pope Francis when he was asked about the women's role in becoming priests, I'm pretty sure he said that is not ever, not in consideration at all. Yeah. Does anybody else recall? I don't recall his, his exact words, but. That's right. You're right about that. Yeah, he did say that. He said that that's, uh, you know, that's been decided. We're not going to talk about it, basically. Right. So, yeah. And just one more comment, Donna. Oh, I was going to say the same thing that I was hopeful for, but uh, Francis, but then early on, he said, no, we're not going to talk about women priests. So. He's probably trying to make a little bit of progress, but not what we're all looking for. Okay. I'm going to go back to my screen share. So tonight I want to talk about the building blocks that Francis is putting in place for reform. And he's, he, you know, every Pope has a lot of documents, writings and things that he does. Uh, and in terms of these aren't this isn't everything that he's written, but this is these are some of the important ones. And I want to focus on the ones that are in bold tonight. Episcopalis Communio, which is an apostolic constitution that he put in place in 2018, and Predicate Evangelium, which has not yet been uh, left set out into the world, but will be. And but they both have. Uh, Big implications, I think, for women in the church, and that's why I'm going to talk about them uh, here tonight. So when Pope Francis became Pope, he began on day one dismantling the centralized, westernized power of the papacy and the curia. He appointed a, car a council of cardinals, the G8, to help make big decisions. And he began choosing cardinals from outside the European stronghold. He began building up the synod offices immediately. I mean, physically, he started making the synod offices bigger because he, he's a synodal bishop. 
And he said these, and these building blocks are critical because his reform agenda has significant implications for women's authority in the church. So this first one I'm going to go talk about is the one that has not yet been released. It was supposed to be released last year. It hasn't been released yet, which is probably a sign that there's quite a bit of struggle around it because what he is going to do with this constitution. So this is the weightiest document uh, that a, a Pope can uh, issue. And it's, it has to do with doctrinal matters, discipline. So it's, it's, a, it's going to be an, ap an apostolic constitution and it's called preach the gospel. And what Francis wants to do with this is carry out his vision for a church that moves away from its sort of clericalism, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, the, 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 the rule keepers, the people who have, as he would say, cold hearts, he says clericalism is, you know, a terrible disease in the church. And he wants to move the church toward its mission of evangelization. So in that movement, he's gonna create this big new super dicastery is just a, another word for office. He's going to create this big office, and this office is going to be second only to the Secretary of State's office. So the Secretary of State's office, so you've got the, the Pope, you've got the Secretary of State in terms of office. This new office, this new office for evangelization will be right underneath that. Now that's bad news for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, because they're going to get downgraded. They used to be in that like number two uh, place, but they're going to get downgraded below evangelization. Again, that goes with Francis's pastoral way, his pastoral vision. The, the, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith is not and hasn't been as scary under Francis as it was for so many people under John Paul II and Benedict. And the Curie also is going to lose a little altitude here. They're no longer going to be the middlemen. <laughs> and this is, really by way, uh, this is really by way of keeping them be, from obstructing so many of the things that went on in the Vatican. So, uh, you know, a, a certain officer, Dicastery, would want to do something, and, the cure, and these men in the middle who thought they were just below the Pope uh, would get in the way and, and actually sometimes undercut what the Pope wanted. And so they are going to lose some of their power and the bishops are going to gain, they're going to gain more stature un, under Predicate Evangelium. And then for women in the church and lay people, it's, this is very important. Lay people are going to be able to head up these dicasteries. Up until this point, only a, a, a cardinal could be a prefect. And so that this is a huge, huge change in the Catholic Church. And maybe the reason we're not seeing it out there yet is because there's Pope Francis has his, you know, uh, College of Cardinals, that small group of cardinals talking to him or that Council of Cardinals talking to him about this. But he also has kind of sent it out into the world. I'm not sure how that went uh, to get sort of feedback on that. So, um, so that's an extremely important piece when we're looking at what will happen? How will women's equality, how will women's leadership, how will women's ministry take shape in the future? How will women enter into governance? This is one way, because once you see women entering into governance in new ways, you're going to see changes, just like in any other organization. Fortune 500 companies have figured this out a long time ago. When you diversify your leadership team, you get a, a, a better product. And so that's what's going to happen in the Catholic Church as well. And then the second piece that is the centerpiece of Francis's pontificate is synodality. He said this at one point, synodality is very close to my heart. Synodality is a style. It is walking together. It is what the Lord expects of the church in the third millennium. So this is, this is a, a the way that the church, that Pope Francis wants the church to function. And so you see here that his document, putting that in place, Episcopalis Communio on September 15, 2018, replaces the one that Paul II it used to initiate the synod. And so in Paul VI's document, 
bishops have a consultative role. The Pope decides, there's no doubt about that. And John Paul II, again, was maybe the, the person who sort of uh, modeled this best. I mean, the, at the synods, there, was, there were jokes, you know, it was day after day of one intervention after another by bishops. People would fall asleep, the Pope would fall asleep. And at the end, the Pope would write the document. So, um, so you know, it was a very different model. With Pope Francis, he wants the bishops to have a deliberative role, and he wants the whole church to discern. So you see, as we in the lead up to the synods that under Pope Francis, he's consulting. They're sending out surveys. Francis is going places. They're getting information from people all over the world. They're trying to consult, so they bring all that in to this discernment process. So he's really br trying to bring the whole church in to discern, and. With Paul's document, Paul VI document, the Pope writes the definitive teaching. This is very important. With Pope Francis, the final document that comes out of the Synod, whatever those bishops agree on, can become part of the ordinary magisterium. That's very, very important that, uh, to know. Now, unfortunately, that didn't happen at, the Synod, happen at the Synod of the Amazon. I thought it would. It did not. Because in the end, Pope Francis has to give it his, you know, blessing, if you will, uh, for it to become part of the ordinary magisterium. But that is a big opening, and that is a big shift in how the authority works in the Catholic Church uh, for the popes to have that, or for the bishops to have that kind of power. And then, under Paul VI, only ordained can vote. Okay, so you bishops, you know, you the religious leaders, but. Under Pope Francis's document, and again, this is very important for women in the church, voting members of the Synod do not have to be ordained. So we saw in 2015, the superior, uh, the male superior general group, the, um, uh, let's, <laughs> losing the first word, uh, the, um, Anyway, the International Union of Superior Generals, the Union of Superior Generals, which is the male group of superior generals, in 2015 sent one religious brother who was a superior to the Senate and he was allowed to vote. Now that got noticed in 2015. And then in 2018, two religious brothers came to the Senate and they were able to vote. And that got a lot of attention and we did a whole campaign around it because religious brothers who are not ordained had the same ecclesial status as uh, women religious superiors. And so the women religious superiors at the Synod could not vote, but these uh, couple of religious uh, superiors who were not ordained could. So that we, we uh, brought that forward and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But the purpose of my telling you about this is that Francis is opening the doors of synods so that people who are not necessarily ordained, therefore not necessarily bishops can vote. So we have under Pope Francis, a number of synods. So in 2014, there was one that was sort of a pre-family synod, but then in 2015 is the synod on the family. Now, another aspect that's important for women is that at the 2015 synod, he creates a brand new format. So instead of having, you know, one intervention after another by bishops day long, day long, he decides early on that he's going to make everybody divide into these small language groups. So there's three English, three, three Spanish, you know, two Italian or whatever, a French and German groups. And they get together. And so for the, for the bulk of those three weeks together, they take a section of the document and they work on it together. Now, the women that are invited to the Synod, uh, there were three of them that year <laughs> uh, in 2015. They got to be part of these, or three, uh, three from the, union, uh, the, the women religious superiors group. They got to be part of these small language groups and they had as much influence on changing those documents as anybody else. So they would decide on language, they say, let's change this. And then they would send those changes up the chain. And so uh, in that way, and he got a lot of pushback about that. A lot of people didn't want to see that kind of influence from everybody in the Senate. So, so uh, he changed the format and that gave women much more influence. And then in 2018, the Synod on the Youth happened just after he put out Episcopalius Communio, this whole document on synodality. 
And so synodality with young people is controversial. It's exciting, but it's controversial because young people at the synod wanted things like LGBTQ rights. They wanted to see women have a much stronger role in the church. They were bringing up the things that we care about. Uh, and so it was, it was a bit of a challenge for, but also I think the bishops probably listened to these young people as they had never listened to people, uh, lay people in the church who came to the sins, who were chosen to come to the sins. I think they listened to them in a way that they never had before. They were touched by these young people. They were so full of life and so full of enthusiasm and so, and so loving and caring. And so at the end of this, okay, so also, again, we have two non-ordained male religious voting, and, uh, and this created a, a, a nice uh, way for us to talk about this in the outside of the Senate. So we developed a campaign, Votes for Catholic Women, and, um, and, and we worked with some of the women religious to, uh, to see what we could do by way of getting women religious to vote. And in 2015, the, there were 10 male religious, and they actually went to Bishop uh, uh, um, Baldessari, the head of the Synod, and said, we have 10 votes, let's give five to the women. And of course, Baldessari said no. So in 2018, we had a lot more uh, uh, talk about this. I was there at the press conferences. I asked questions as often as I could. I made, there were a lot of bishops that actually learned about this that there were non-ordained male religious voting and that women religious should vote. And they may not have shared the opinion, but at least they understood the issue after uh, it came alive for us there. And then in 2019, uh, the Synod on the Amazon, I would say the expectations were much higher around synodality. And I, again, was so taken in by the listening to the stories of the women of the Amazon. You know, I heard stories of women who were teaching and preaching and baptizing and blessing and hearing confessions and burying the dead and officiating at marriages. They were doing the work of the priest or a deacon in the absence of, of priests. I mean, it's rare for a priest to show up. So the women are actually leading the church. And to hear their stories, you just rooted for them. And then when you heard that their bishops understood who was running the church, who was, who was the backbone of the church, who was holding this church up and expanding it in this very endangered region of the world, you just were rooting for all of them. And, I, and when you looked at the final vote, the bishops from the Amazon, many of them wanted women ordained deacons right away because women were already doing the work. It was just more or less saying, yep, they already are deacons or priests, but they were talking about deacons then. And so let's ordain them. And then, of course, they wanted married, married priests because uh, the European model of priesthood, uh, celibacy is a non-starter in that part of the world. Uh, men do, are not going to be celibate. And so they wanted to, to bring in married priests. And most people actually thought that, you know, that at least the married priest part would go forward. And, uh, and it, of course, it didn't. And then in 2022, there's going to be another synod. It's going to be a synod on synods. And it just shows how important this idea of synodality is to this pope. Uh, he is, he's going to make this the way of the church. So at the, at the synod uh, on the Amazon, this is a pretty famous guy, this Bishop Erwin Krautler. Uh, he's, he's had conversations with the pope before. He lives in Brazil. And he was very outspoken. He was one of the Brazilian bishops, one of the Amazon bishops, who was very forthright about what women were doing and what we should, what we should do. And this is just one of the comments. He says, two thirds of our communities are animated, run by women. We have to think about this. We have to proclaim, proclaim the women and their work and we need concrete solutions. So why not women deacons? And again, if you looked at the numbers, the, the, the bishops from the Amazon understood exactly what those women were doing and supported them and wanted to see that happen. And I would have to say that it was uh, the bishops who were from outside of that who uh, were not as open to the, the notion of women deacons. But uh, still, the notion in the final document, 
There was, uh, the bishops came to the proposals together. They said, let's push forward married men and let's have a continue the discussion or the study of women deacons. And, um, and so when Francis wrote his post um, uh, uh, synodal exhortation, uh, uh, Querida Amazonia, he basically said, no. Uh, he basically said, and this promise of giving a blessing to these proposals and making part of the or, uh, ordinary magisterium really shows the limits of synodality. Uh, and, you know, a lot of us were really hopeful there, uh, you know, because uh, the men and the women of, were sh that shaped that final document were so forceful in their call for the protection of the Amazon as well as pioneering new ministries to carry out the work of the gospel there. They called for a priesthood that, called, that included married men and asked the church to continue the dialogue on women deacons, but it didn't happen. And we're not sure why. Uh, we, some people believe that Francis drew back because of pressures from within. Some people believe that people were pressuring because of what was happening in this in Germany, which is another piece I'm going to talk about in a little bit, where they are working together, lay and ordained in a synod atmosphere to, to uh, bring new ideas to the church there. And, uh, and so we don't know exactly why Pope Francis pulled back. I was actually sh very surprised and, and hurt because I thought, how do you, I mean, I worked, as you heard in my bio, I worked in a domestic violence agency. Um, when women are in danger, when women are living at the edge, you do everything you can to help them. And I thought, you had it all in your power. So I don't know all the forces that are around him, but I thought you failed those women. That's how I felt in the beginning. You failed them. You should have made sure that they got what they needed in order to do the work in, in, the, in, um, in the Amazon. But let me tell you that despite those, that, that particular disappointment, that particular setback, that I believe that the church, that Pope Francis has done a lot in terms of helping women's, women become, uh, have greater authority in the church. And you're right, he has said no to the priesthood, which is in, in very important. But I think he's gonna do it as Francis always does in, in other ways. So, but let me begin this section by saying that none of the progress that I cite here would have happened had women not been pressing for change. Women are the agents of change in this. They're the ones that are moving it forward. So behind every appointment that I talk about, every commission I talk about, every step of progress for women, there are women somewhere in that background making that happen. So in 2013, the first year, Pope Francis starts with this Evangelii Gaudium. And the first thing he says, and one of the things he says that's very important is we need to create broader opportunities for more incisive female presence in the church. And then in 2014, he, um, he appoints Sister Mary Malone as the first female rector of a Roman pontifical university. Now this is, it shows how important it is when a woman gets appointed because once she gets appointed there, she makes that a safe space for women to come and have public meetings about the church and women who are challenging the church as well as those who think the church is just fine the way it is. So female appointments like this are really, really important. And then in that same year, he appointed Marie Collins, an Irish survivor of priest abuse, and a number of other women to the first ever Vatican Commission for the Protection of Children. So here's Marie sitting next to Sean O'Malley. She came to the United States uh, about a year ago. We did a tour with her and she's just an amazing woman. She is uh, a woman of great integrity. She was an abuse victim herself. She knows what she's talking about. And she really worked within the system for about three years. 
But what she realized at the end of three years was that these Curia middlemen that I talked about in the beginning, they were just getting in the way. They were stopping things from happening. She said, even the simplest request that we had was answer the letters of victims was not getting, there was nothing happening. So she finally resigned very publicly. And it was, uh, it was, is actually quite powerful to have her do that. In 2015, Pope Francis halts the Vatican crackdown on the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. And he invites the leadership team to the Vatican. I don't know if you remember that photo, it's kind of iconic. But this is the first time the women have been invited and what does he do? <laughs> he just thanks them and says, carry on women, you're doing great. At the Synod on the Family in 2015, Sister Carmen Samu lobbies. I'm going to show you a picture of here because she's amazing. She's one of my he heroes. So Sister Carmen Samu is the president of this international organization for women religious superiors. And so she lobbies like crazy for at this 2015 Synod prior to it to get women from her congregations or uh, her sisters invited. And so she gets three invited. Uh, and then she's so savvy that she's, they had invited Pope Francis to their, they have a meeting every three years. And so they had been writing to Francis, inviting him in, and she hadn't heard back from him. And so here's a photo of her going up to Francis during one of the coffee breaks. And she says, you know, Pope Francis, uh, you know, um, I've been inviting you to our, our meeting and I haven't heard back from you. And he said, oh, I didn't, I didn't get a, a letter. I didn't get an invitation. And so the next day she gets a handwritten letter from Pope Francis uh, saying, I'm gonna show up. And that has important implications as you'll see in just a little bit. And as, part of, as one of the three women who got invited to the 2015 uh, Synod, Sister and Maureen Kelleher, was one of them, she's a US sister. And so she's in these little small language groups. Uh, she's in, the, in these small groups with uh, Sister Maureen Kelleher, or with, uh, uh, and one of her partners in that group is uh, um, uh, Archbishop Chaput. And she said, um, and so she didn't have a very good experience in her small language group. She said that he came with all of his ideas, he said, came with his bags packed. He knew everything he wanted to say. He wasn't open to new ideas. And she said, and they treated her, they said, oh, you're the sister with the bleeding heart. She said, the condescension was so thick, you could cut it with a knife. And so, uh, so as women pioneers often find out that it's not always easy being one of the, some of the first to do, uh, to be a part of these things. Um, the Canadian Archbishop Paul Andre Drew Rocher, for the first time called for women deacons uh, uh, for, during his uh, intercession. Uh, and so that was important. It's a, it snowballs in 2019. And as I told you before, the structure of the Synod changes to give um, women uh, more influence in the shaping of the document and, uh, and males are, male religious that are not ordained are voting. That's Sister Maureen Kelleher, another one of my important. Let's see here. Now I'm trying to figure out how to go back to where I was. Okay. In 2000 and let's see, is this 16? Yeah. In 2016, Pope Francis does another thing that seems kind of inconsequential in the United States, but it has big implications universally. He issues a decree for on the Holy Thursday foot washing ceremony, which officially calls for the inclusion of women. So, like I said, this has been going on for, um, there he is, washing the foot of a woman, uh, woman which is actually a very, very powerful um, symbol for women in, the, in India and other places in the world where their priests were so incensed by this that some of them said, we're not even going to have the ceremony to have women involved, because for them, this is about priests washing the feet of other priests. So, um, so that's uh, very important. And then at the 2016 meeting uh, of the UISG, the Women Superiors, this is a beautiful photo of 
Francis and Sister Carmen sitting next to each other. It's, it's sort of iconic. It's what the church could be if we, <laughs> if we were co-partners. And it is at this meeting that Sister Carmen asked Pope Francis to open the discussion on women deacons. And Pope Francis, they said, you know, why can't you just study it? And he said, well, I will. And in lightning speed, so this is May, by August, the commission is set up. And it's a gender balance, balance commission. And Phyllis Sagano, as we all know, was a part of that commission. In June of that year, he raises the memorial of, uh, the, of St. Mary of Magdalene, Magdala uh, from, a fee, from a memorial to a feast day, which has big implications liturgically. We hear her story. Uh, she is now known as an apostle to the apostle officially. And this begins to um, hack away, if you will, uh, at the, the notion that we've gotten in so many ways that Mary Magda was a prostitute. Instead, she's uh, on par with Peter and Paul in the church. Very, very important. And then in 2017, he appoints two Italian women uh, as undersecretaries. They have authority in this uh, combined dicastery for uh, a laity and family and women. In 2018, at the end of the Synod on Youth, in the final document, there are three paragraphs on women. And for the first time, it says the inclusion of women in the church is a matter of justice. We've never seen that language before. A whole, these, uh, we have this whole campaign around votes for Catholic women because we want the Catholic women religious to be able to vote. So this is a picture, I'm in, I'm in not in this picture, but this is part of our work uh, for uh, outside of the Vatican, outside of the Synod, where we uh, called for uh, women to vote. So we prayed and sang and chanted and, and uh, the New York Times covered us, called us modern day suff suffragists, uh, demanding the right to vote. And, and we continue that work even now because, uh, and believe it will happen. We believe that there will come a day not far in the future when women will be voting at the Synod alongside men. And then we, uh, looking at 2019, this is actually a, uh, a pretty good year. Pope Francis, for the first time, publicly acknowledges what we've all known for a long time, that women religious were being sexually abused by priests. So in February 2019 is the first time he does that. And that happens because, um, so uh, just to say in May, in May, he appointed the first women consultors for the Senate of Bishops, that's brand new. Uh, those women will have uh, some influence in how the synods go. He appointed seven women to the governing body of the Congregation for Women Religious. Now, that's very important. They're going to have a consult. They're not just a consultative voice. They'll have a deliberative voice as part of the governing board. And then in October, the, the bishops, again, recognized that women were the church in, this, in the Amazon and that they should be, called, they should be deacons. In, in 220, Pope Francis started this year by reiterating his determination that we need to include women in, in decision-making processes. He named the first woman to hold a high-ranking post at the Secretary of State. Uh, and then he appointed six European women to this Council on the Economy. So he keeps putting women into places of authority. And that's really important. It's gonna make a difference further down the road. And then this October, his whole prayer intention for this month is that, that, that we have a more incisive presence of women in the church. To me, that means he's getting ready to do something. He's getting us ready. He's, he's, he's getting the, the church ready for this. And other signs of hope very quickly, I talked about the German Synod. This is a very important watch Germany. There's a lot of things going on there. The Germans, the Germans are, are trying this great experiment where they're gonna make decisions about the church together. Lay people, women have a deliberative voice along with the ordained men. And then Maria 2.0 from Germany last year, the German women in mass struck for a whole week. They didn't come to church. They didn't teach classes. They didn't clean altars. They did nothing. And their efforts have gotten the attention of the of clerics in their country, which is part of the reason I think that the Synod is, is including uh, talking about women in church leadership. So you can see below here, they're standing arm in arm around the uh, cathedral in Cologne. Uh, they, they have made a lot of progress in Germany and they're worth watching. 
The, these women from France are, are applying for ecclesial positions in the church. Uh, Anna Supa uh, took the front stage, but all these women joined together and on, on the Feast of Mary Magdala, they all applied for, for positions that are held by clerics in the church and they've got a meeting with uh, an ambassador from the Vatican. So they're making some progress. It'll be interesting to watch what they do here. And then in 2020, Future Church and uh, at least 40 organizations from around the world are going to be coming together uh, in 2022 to go to, the, to Rome together, to hold a synod together, to be a presence, uh, a large presence in the Vatican, in St. Peter's Square, and to let the church know, like the German women, that they, we need them to pay attention. It's time for business as usual to end and to have real women's place in the church. And so I just want to end by just saying, uh, this is some of our beautiful art, by the way. You've seen a couple pieces of it. We just newly commissioned this art for a whole project we're doing on racism within the church. But I believe that we have hope because I, like, I do believe what Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of history bends toward justice. It's true in the Catholic church as it is in the world. And that women and their allies are the drivers of this change. That's the greatest hope we have because because of them, history and tradition has been recovered and uncovered and papal strategies and evolving Vatican structures have, have been shaped by the fact that women are involved and women are, are pressuring in the church. So that's it. Thank you so much, Deb. You've given us much to ponder and to discuss and look forward with uh, the signs of hope that you have uncovered for us. Uh, Evie will now break us up into break rooms of five to six people. Uh, and our questions are, what are your takeaways? And where do we go from here? Do you want to conclude for us here? I, I just want, in our group, in, in our group, we, first we dealt with all of the depressing news that you gave us. But then we were able to turn to, to some of the other news. I wanted to thank you. This was a really insightful presentation. Thanks. I learned a lot. I, I really did. We did. We all did. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I want to go back just to that comment that Frank Harris had earlier about people are coming here because other doors are closed. We have to remember the hierarchy is not the church we are the church. That's right. And that's, thank you very much for bringing that all home to us. Amen. Amen. We are the church. Well, it sounds to me like we've had some pretty uh, full participation from women in the Catholic Church during our <laughs> event here tonight. So I thank each of you uh, as well as Deb. Thank you very much. Um, for some conclusion comments before our ending prayer, I uh, wanted to uh, thank everyone and to invite all of you to participate, uh, continue to participate with us by visiting our website, the Association of Pittsburgh Priest.com. And um, we would ask donations too tonight to go there to help support us. We're just in the process now of beginning to uh, put together our spring series, and uh, we hope to um, have the support that we need in order to do that. Uh, secondly, um, we are a membership organization. So we would invite you to uh, become a member. As you heard when I said the mission in the beginning, we are ordained and non-ordained uh, baptized Christians. So um, please feel free to join us. You can do that by on our website or by uh, writing to us. Uh, we have a post office box, 2106, Pittsburgh 15230. So we also invite you to be uh, a friend to the APP you can do that by visiting our website and sharing your contact information. Uh, next, we would ask you to consider becoming a volunteer. Um, we have a need for project management. So if you could uh, help us to continue to bring forth our speakers uh, events, it takes uh, some planning to do that. And uh, we would welcome your participation in that. And Jim and Evie are uh, the people that you can contact uh, to let us know of your interest and willingness to help us continue uh, with our uh, events. Next, uh, we are very excited about uh, the book that was produced last year by Art McDonald. 
it's our 50 year history of the Association of Pittsburgh Priests and just for $18. And you see Deb clapping there. Uh, <laughs> she read the book and she gave us a thumbs up. So um, that was pretty good stamp of approval. Uh, so please consider uh, this book. Uh, the people who have read it have had wonderful feedback from it. And you really do learn a lot about uh, the history of the progressive movement here in the Pittsburgh Diocese, uh, which has been a light for these 50 plus years. Uh, next, um, I'd like to uh, invite you to our next event. This is the last of our speakers in our fall speaker series, uh, Massimo Fagioli, and he is uh, an expert in ecclesial movements. And um, this is really where um, the laity are taking a lot of the lead. Uh, he'll talk about globally, but also here in the United States. And, and I think we'll want to talk a little bit about our own um, ecclesial movements happening locally, like uh, the CCOC and the Association of Pittsburgh Priests. So um, we invite you to come and to share this information with others, invite them to come. And as you did tonight, you would register at our uh, Association of Pittsburgh Priests website in order to uh, join us. So now, uh, oh, before I invite Becky to uh, lead us in our closing prayer, I just like to say, it looks like we're gonna have an election. So I invite everybody to vote early and to vote early. <laughs> <laughs> early and often. <laughs> okay, Becky, uh, please uh, help us to end our evening with prayer. The universe. Long ago, you spoke through an angel to your servant Mary, who opened her entire being in response to your creative word. In the gift of that word, she carried Christ in her room and into the world. Today you are speaking through your spirit to the hearts of women around the world, inviting them to be Christ bearers to serve in the sacramental priesthood of the church. They have heard you and like Mary, they hunger to respond with their entire being. Give courage and freedom to them and to the citizens of your church, both women and men to open and embrace the sacred space that will make their priesthood a living reality in today's world, which waits in need of the gifts that they are called to bring to your table. Amen. 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 Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Deb. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Deb. Thanks, thanks, thanks. You're welcome. You're That's welcome. Father Osterley who invited you. <laughs> ah, there he is. Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Great. <laughs>